be on this panel just because there's so much to debrief back there. It's beautiful. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Great. Well, thank you all for being here again. It's, a, it's really nice to be together. And to still, I still cherish the idea of being able to be in a theater together. So thank you. Um, you know, I'm a scientist turned filmmaker, and I always feel like making a documentary film is such a brave act, and your film is particularly courageous. So thank you for sharing your story, Jamie. Um, I just wanted to remind you all that the goal for our storied health is to reset our cursor on storytelling for the field of public health and to elevate narrative as a public health intervention. Our, help is that our, our hope is that our panel tonight can speak to not only the topics explored in the film, but also help us understand how we can level up storytelling for public health. So Jamie, we'll start, we'll start with you. Um, in your director's statement, you write, I was drawn to the camera at a very young age, unaware that it would become my sole weapon against the tidal wave of misinformation disseminated by some of the most powerful and corrupt forces in the world. So tell us why you made this documentary, and was it more that you were drawn to the story at sort of from an activist perspective as a call to action, or was it really to shine a light on your family history and unpack it more as an artist. Did you have separate hats, or can you bring us into that yeah. process a little bit? No, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, and, and, and also thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be, so happy to be here, and honored, and honored to be amongst you all um, and to share my family's story. So thank you all for watching and being here. Um, yeah, as you were saying that, I think it was both. It was both and everything, and it was different at probably different points. So when I first started filming at 19, um, it was, I didn't really feel like I had a choice. It was the only thing I could think to do, and it was something to do, and it was like kind of a witness and also, you know, like a fifth man, family member to stand beside me, and the only tool I had to kind of reflect back what I was seeing um, but I also was, you know, to your point about this initiative, I was just, I had just switched my major to film after getting rejected from the same journalism school that my sister, twice, that got into without even trying and on opioids, so. Um, <laughs> but um, I switched it to film, so I had been interested in journalism and I wanted to do investigative journalism and then I found, kind of found out about documentary and what it was capable of at the exact same time I was watching this happen. And I was learning that there were, you know, injustices in the world, and that documentary was one form of activism, um, and an, and a tool to to do something about it, if nothing else, and just tell people. And I think I was watching something in my home that I just wanted to shout from the rooftops, and you know, hold everybody by the shoulders and neck, and say, "What is going on? And and how many people is this happening to? And and how did we get here?" So it was kind of like the perfect convergence, and then and then. From then on, like I never wanted to do anything but documentary. Really, after that, um, and so I've, you know, then I kind of started a career in that, and I came back to it about ten years later when, you know, it it had it was dominating all of our headlines, and um, it had pretty much taken the country by storm, and and I was watching them face new hurdles in in staying sober and in dealing with the medical community, and I felt like, you know, I didn't have much material, but I had an, enough. And I always felt like if you could see this the way I saw it, if you could you know, feel like this was your sister or your mother, and sadly most people have, um, but on a massive scale if we could experience that, it's that collective experience that I think that's where art and storytelling come into play. And I feel like then we can all, if we can all look at the same thing, we can say, okay, this is pretty clear cut. Um, so yeah, it was a both end, and it's definitely a therapeutic tool for me too. Um, and you are always walking that line between, you know, healing and re-traumatizing yourself. And I think we're learning more and more about that. So there are lines to, you know, walk and boundaries to patrol. But, but overall, it felt like a huge gift that I had that. Absolutely. It's a gift to us all, I think, your brilliant uh, filmmaking. Thank you. Jody and Alex. Um, so documentary for films can be a powerful vehicle for a core truth of storytelling, that people want to be understood. As filmmakers, we use the camera to understand where people are coming from, what they are going through, and if it's a film with a call to action to try to humanize our solutions. So this also, for me, tracks with maybe some recovery strategies. 
with the idea of meeting people where they're at. Um, so Jody, maybe we'll start with you. What, what do you want us to know most about the story of addiction and in, in all of your years of work and after watching Jamie's film? You know, is there something that we're that you're reminded of by this film or that we're missing from the addiction narrative? What, what is it for you? Well, I mean, first of all, this was brilliant. It was really wonderful, and uh, it, um, it captured so much of what, you know, so many uh, things rang true. I mean, there, uh, um, about a decade ago, I sort of made a conscious decision to focus a little more on the opioid crisis and overdose uh, rather than HIV and infectious diseases and corrections, although they're all sort of intertwined. But the, um, the more I've delved into it and dug into it, the more complex it, mm -hmm. it, it gets. And, you know, so this is, you're know, thinking about this problem, I mean, you touched on so much of it. And you missed, the, there's, there's a lot you missed, but um, I, I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's brilliant. I, you know, they used to say, well, for every very complicated problem, there is a single, simple, inexpensive, and ineffective solution. <laughs> there is no si simple, there is no solution that's going to work that's simple. I mean, we can, we can nibble around the edges, and we just need to keep trying and, and moving forward. Um, I, I will point out that um, the epidemic has evolved uh, rapidly mm. since this. I mean, wh you know, Kolodny's right that th this was the Sacklers and their greed and really, uh, it was brilliant. Um, um, and uh, and they, they found the key problem was the f physician's reluctance to get people addicted. But of course, you know, a hundred years ago, physicians were not allowed to treat addiction, not allowed to deal with addiction. Um, and so physicians haven't. We have kind of stayed in our other medical lane. Addiction is something treated over there in the, uh, in the methadone programs mm -hmm. on the other side of the tracks that are completely uh, uh, divorced mm -hmm. from regular medical care. Um, so, <clears throat> and our whole society has that notion of addiction being something, you know, it's a stigmatized condition. And that, um, you know, I think your family story was a little different than, um, because you didn't have a lot of that stigma. Um, it's still a very valid story. It's still a very, you know, this, this disease, when I meet someone, and I've met thousands of people, and I've asked them their stories, and, you know, they've, some of them have said, oh, I can't remember the first time I used them. Some of them said, oh, yeah, when I got that, like, that was, this is different. This is, this is either what I've been searching for or this was, you know, this is, this is different, just like your sister. I mean, she said it so brilliantly. Um, and also her description of withdrawal. I've heard that thousands of times, but it's like, yeah, you feel like you're gonna die. Like you, this is the most, you know, and, and you will do whatever it takes yeah. to not die. And that whole time you're going into that, you know, it's not like you go from, oh, I'm normal to I'm dying. Uh, usually, uh, you kind of get into it and you know what it's like, and that whole time, all you need is a little fingernail full of some opiate mm -hmm. into your body, and it's just going to melt away. Um, so, uh, you know, part of the reason why that story was a little different was because it was during the oxycodone era. Like, you, you can't get buprenorphine, can't get suboxone, but you can get all the oxys you want. Oh, well, we went to the emergency room, they did all the tests, and nothing's wrong with you, so you need some more oxys. Yeah, uh, yeah that, um, so. Yeah, I, no, I think I, you covered I, it. I dribbled yeah. along too long. What was the no, question again? it was good. I was just thinking about, you know, um, just this general story of addiction, if anything that you really yeah. felt like stuck out in your well, years of work, like, yeah, so that you, get, you latch on to. The, the um, uh, you know, one part of the story happened after the uh, this, and, and the one quote that your sister said, she was scrambling to get any, scrambling mm -hmm. to get anything into her system, like anything, like this desperation. That's kind of the fourth wave of the epidemic. Yeah. You know, the first wave was was kicked off by overprescribing and on a massive scale, mm -hmm. and uh, that was really described brilliantly. 
the next phase was the transition to heroin, and you heard that that was covered nicely too. Mm -hmm. The guys say, "Oh yeah, you know, you can't. You know, pills are a little tough to get, but you know, you can walk down the street with someone giving you some heroin." So, the second phase was switching to heroin, and then heroin is semi-synthetic. It's grown. It's a poppy plant, and it has to be grown somewhere, and it has to be transported and processed. Um, and frankly, Purdue did such a good job getting so many people hooked that so many people transitioned to heroin that they started stressing the supply, the worldwide mm -hmm. supply of heroin, and then went into synthetics. So mm -hmm. if you want to sneak a cooler of heroin into Rhode Island, you know, you put that in the trunk of your car, you, you do something. Um, but if you uh, have fentanyl, which is fully synthetic, you just need some reagents and you need a, a half-decent chemist and you can make up a whole vat of it, uh, and the comparable potency, it's 50 times more powerful, would fit into a cigarette pack. And you don't need to grow poppy seeds anywhere. So the production just ramped up, just as with the prohibition, with alcohol prohibition, it started with smuggling beer and wine, but quickly moved to spirits because they're so, so much more concentrated. So uh, then COVID hit uh, during this, so the synthetic, the fentanyl way, which 50 times more powerful was very deadly. And that, that started on the East Coast and kind of worked its way west. Um, and then during COVID, when so many people's recovery sport got kneecapped and they, uh, and a lot of people were, were still struggling, uh, it became polysubstance. So not just yeah. opiates, but just like your sister described, mm -hmm. I would use anything. Yeah. Um, but, but just the, la the final point that is, um, sort of missing, not, you know, needs a little more attention. Uh, your sister um, struggled to get into a rehab and she got into a rehab. And then it's like all of a sudden, you know, she's nine years clean. And it's I hate that. Of. I hate that her word clean yeah. uh, because it implies, it, it sort of reinforces the stigma. If you're clean, you know, and, and patients say, yeah, well, I'm not clean. Well, did you take a shower this morning? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're clean. You're just... Yeah. You know, because the opposite is dirty. Mm -hmm. So you are just dirty mm -hmm. internally, and, and that's, uh, that doesn't help. Um, okay. But, um, you know, but you did describe your mom getting on to buprenorphine yeah. and how it just, I mean, your mm -hmm. father's description was great. Like, and, and I've seen that so many times. It's mm -hmm. like you just, you know, and, and so many patients, I would say more than half that walk through the door, their lives are taken over and, you know, destroyed. The whole family is suffering. Mm -hmm. And it's like magic. You give them a prescription for buprenorphine, and that's really all yeah. they need, a little pat on the back, and that, oh, my God, she's back. She has her life back. Yeah. She has her family back. She's functioning again. Uh, and, you know, and this was years later, yeah. and she's doing great. Uh, so th I think, you know, it would be nice to have a little more, um, uh, a little more, uh, and you can't cover it all in this one, but more well, description no, I mean... of, of how people can get yeah. into recovery and do. No, you make such a good point, and I don't want to take up too much airtime because I've already <laughs> taken up a lot. <laughs> but um, one of the things I have talked a lot about on Q&As is that, you know, we don't name it in the film, but Jordan's in a 12-step program, and she's in Narcotics mm -hmm. Anonymous. And, um, you know, I, mo a lot of people know by now there's been amazing writing and reporting on this, but, you know, um, they're very traditional, and they're very, you know, old school, and it's mm -hmm. based out of AA, and a lot of the you know, a lot of the thinking behind it up until really recently was, you know, you weren't even considered clean or allowed in the rooms if you were on something like bu mm -hmm. buprenorphine or Suboxone. And so mm -hmm. that tension was also still happening in my family when I was filming. We've gotten past wow. a lot of that. But, you know, it always broke my heart because those two who should be more in each other's corners than anybody, my mom wasn't allowed at my sister's meetings or didn't really feel welcome and didn't really feel like my sister saw her as clean in the same way she was clean mm. or sober or passed it in recovery in the same way. And my sister didn't dare consider medication-assisted treatment because, again, she would be ostracized from the mm -hmm. only community she knew. So to see that we're so lacking in the one giant entity where mm -hmm. people can turn to in this country, which is a 12-step program, was really heartbreaking. And there, I've, I've seen it, that they're starting to make progress in that way. And I even had some scenes in the film I used to where 
some of that start, tension is starting to come up. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I was already putting them through so much <laughs> by, and they were already so giving to me that mm -hmm. to pull on things that we're still kind of wrestling mm -hmm. with as a family was maybe a little too far. But it's something that we're really trying to shape like some of the campaign around because I think if there's, you know, one giant thing that's risking their health and wellness now, it might be that continued ostracizing um, and the, you know, that kind of old school outdated thinking that I think we know a lot better now. So, um, so I, I appreciate you bringing That's that up. That's the next film. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, when we're and, past it. I want to hear from Alex, but I do want to make one just for the whole audience. You know, people with opioid use disorder, the best treatment we have is medication. And we, I don't like the term medication assisted treatment because it implies that there's some treatment out there that the medication is somehow assisting. Oh, yeah. But, uh, and there that is treatment, sense. there's counseling mm -hmm. and 12 mm -hmm. step is peer that support, it's wonderful, except that is not nearly effective as the medications. The medications, methadone, buprenorphine or suboxone, yeah. and even deep bone naltrexone, they drop your risk by 50% right out the gate. Yeah. Um, and 80% of Americans with opioid use disorder are not even offered these medications. Mm -hmm. So we are way behind the eight mm -hmm. ball. People go to a 12-step program because somebody says, oh, you got to go to 90 meetings in 90 days when they finally realize they have a problem. And they're discouraged. People are discouraged to talk about that they're on these medications. So half the people in the meeting are on the medications because that's why they're yeah. in recovery. But they can't say anything. So a young person thinks, oh, well, I just got to get through all these you know, mm -hmm. 90 days. And they walk out and they die of an overdose. So, and including Jordan saying that she doesn't know anybody who she went into recovery yeah. with was really intentional. Oh, sure. And oh, yeah. because she doesn't. And yeah. I've traveled the country now yeah. and I've never met anybody like her. So right. that's the one thing I hate right. to use her as an example yeah. because yeah. she doesn't mm -hmm. exist anywhere right. else. <laughs> mm -hmm. So Alex, as an epidemiologist, I was one too, or maybe I'm a recovering epidemiologist <laughs> as a filmmaker. But I do, I do think about um, the epidemiology as sort of a natural in natural parallel with storytelling because you're thinking about patterns mm -hmm. of our population. And as filmmakers, we think about stories as patterns of image and sound. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to know, and I know that you're a prolific writer, are there, are there things that you look for in, in writing about, about your work, things that you can share with the audience, tips, how to frame things around language, or when you think about the story of, of your work, thinking about the epidemiology of, of substance Use. Yeah, yeah. How so, do you, so, how do you do that? Yeah, so I guess thinking, so even in epidemiology as well, it is storytelling. So, going back to Jody's point about these kind of subsequent waves of the overdose crisis, how it, you know, kicked off with prescription opioids and then, you know, shifted to heroin and to fentanyl, and now this, um, this fourth wave that we're living in now, which is characterized by polysubstance use and increasing stimulant use disorder. To me, when I was watching this film, I just felt like, well, first, I just need to tell you that it was so beautifully done and incredibly well shot. And there were so many things that just spoke to me personally as well. I feel like there's, and it's so important to capture the experiences of folks with opioid use disorder themselves, of course, but it's also really rare to get this really raw look into the experiences of people, of their loved ones, and um, the, the ways in which the opioid crisis affects not just those individuals, but um, kind of spreads out through those, through those networks. Um, and, you know, like, I guess for myself, having grown up in a, in a household with someone with opioid use disorder, like, I get the struggle. It's tough. And when you're talking about, like, diagnoses, I'm like, girl, it's... Anyway. So many um, diagnoses. Yeah, there's... Yeah, and I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, it's challenging. Um, and I think that in telling that, you, you spoke really beautifully to how the epidemic kind of creates these kind of subsequent waves, not just these waves of the crisis, but... Um, you know, the, the ripple effect and how it affects those, those folks around us as well. Um, I was also reflecting on how I think your story and your family captures really beautifully, almost quintessentially, like the first wave, like the prescription opioid crisis. Because like I look at these images of your mother and your sister and you, 
I mean, just stating, I guess, the obvious, like they're, you know, beautiful white women mm -hmm. and doctors, I'm sure had no hesitation yes. prescribing to them. Whereas, you know, in, in black communities across the United States, like it's been described as this rare instance in which racism um, has been described as protecting black Americans because in that first wave, there was this um, perception by doctors that their black patients would be much more likely to, <clears throat> in their words, like abuse these medications and misuse them, which is why this first wave of the overdose crisis was, was really, truly characterized by um, uh, disproportionately affecting white America and white Americans. Um, and I also kind of think to seeing this firsthand too. So I'm um, originally from West Virginia. Oh. I loved so much that you showed, um, you know, the little snapshots of there. And that's exactly the reason why I fell into this work is because um, that for, for, for those of you in the audience who don't know, um, the overdose crisis, uh, West Virginia has had some of the highest rates of overdose in the country for the past two decades, and it's in part because it's a rural community, it's a predominantly white community. It was hit early, hard, and fast by the prescription opioid, opioid crisis because um, pharmaceutical companies um, really funneled prescription opioids into that community really early on, and um, the, the aftershocks of, of um, those decisions kind of continue continue to re re reflect themselves in the ongoing overdose crisis in that um, region of the world or in that re region of the nation. So um, I feel like I had other pieces, but I'll leave airspace for others. <laughs> well, I think you should point out that what's happened since it was a white epidemic, and now oh more yeah recently it's, yeah uh, absolutely. So you know. Um, when the overdose crisis was iatrogenically driven, that being you know driven by doctors and prescribing to folks, it was early on uh, predominantly um, an issue that did predominantly affect white Americans. But um, as we started to tamp down on opioid prescribing and um, heroin became more um, more pervasive and more readily available in in drug markets uh, for folks. Um, one, it was cheaper, so a lot of people switched for that reason. Two, it was more readily available. And then three, um, because heroin is available outside of the medical system, it's not um, affected by the uh, by racist structures within it. So heroin is far less discerning, and we're seeing a dramatic increase in you know, both heroin and the subsequent waves of fentanyl and, and, and this fourth wave. Um, in, over the past decade, we've seen a significant increase in overdose deaths among black Americans across the U.S. Um, I will speak very, very briefly to um, just potential solutions and kind of looking forward. Um, I loved so much that near the end you started touching on the, the, the opioid settlements and um, there's, they owe us so much. We should have much more money, even, even more so from, from the Sacklers. But um, where to start? So just, just last week, actually. So the, the state of Rhode Island has um, OSAC, the Opioid Settlement Advise, Ad, Advisory Committee. Um, and just last week, I was um, elected to be an, an, ex, um, an expert advisor to this committee. So as part of all of these settlements that have been made across the country, um, states have the ability to um, invest funds that come from these opioid from these settlements with um, with uh, opioid prescribing companies like and with the Sacklers mm -hmm. to now invest those funds in solutions. And I feel really excited to have the opportunity to start to think really critically about these solutions for Rhode Island. Uh, currently, we have, as I understand, about $100 million that will be paid out over the next 18 years. Um, and we're already using these funds to establish the first um, overdose prevention center, or one of the first overdose prevention centers in the country, which I'm incredibly excited about. Um, Rhode Island has truly been kind of leading the way uh, when it comes to a lot of harm reduction and pro progressive approaches. So, all right.
I've spoken enough. I'll, I'll pass on. That's great. Thank Do you. Do you want to add anything else? I'm just listening. No, I in. love ending sort of on that solutions note mm -hmm. um, in terms of our discussion, but I'm sure there might be questions. Yeah, the let's go to the audience. Um, there should this be again, mics. The lights are very bright, so it's hard. Yes. Uh, we have some microphones if anyone would like to ask questions. I've got a question. How many, uh, how many people have seen the film so far? Oh gosh, I don't know if we've kept a good count. Mm. That's a great question. I know how many Narcan we've handed out <laughs> um, and training. Yeah, I mean, I'd say it's probably been in. Uh, 25 states and it's done festivals across the country and a theatrical run and now it's available to rent and we're really trying to get it into places like this and um, now we're trying to get it into medical schools um, and have it, uh, you know, I I don't know, I think a, if it's not already and I don't know if it is but I, I think every doctor, every medical school should have a requirement of the history of the opioid epidemic in this and every drug epidemic in this country, um, aside from required addiction training. Um, and speaking about solutions too, I think um, one of the things I've realized in watching this film so many times is a few things that I didn't realize before. One thing I did realize before, which was that the fact that so many systems were built in our favor mm -hmm. um, is a huge reason why they're alive and healthy. Mm -hmm. um, so as much as we talk about everything we were up against within the medical community, at mm -hmm. the same time, you know, you heard there were a million ways all throughout the film where had we not been white, had we not been mm -hmm. middle class, it would have been an entirely different story, mostly been white. I mean, the times Jordan stole and was let off the hook, the times she mm -hmm. was pulled over and clearly inebriated, the times my mom wrote a fake prescription and then was allowed to fly out of the state. And she didn't actually end up going to rehab, you know, and then she was able to, ex it, was, it was wiped from her record because they could afford a lawyer to wipe, I mean, a million things so she could work again. You could go on and on and on to where there would have been a roadblock and, and most likely a life-threatening roadblock at any one of those junctures. Um, and so the hope is that if we could do that for everybody, there is hope. Um, and the other thing that I realized just while watching it was that they had this kind of wraparound support and love because we thought we were dealing with a different deadly illness than we were dealing with. Mm -hmm. Even we were not, you hear, we use outdated terminology. We didn't know we were dealing with addiction. Had we known that, we would not have treated it like we did. We thought they were dying. So there was love and care and there was bills paid and you know checking on each other. And so if we could treat addiction like the disease that it is, again, you see it works. You know, there are things that work. And my mom now says she was enabling. And I think where we've come, what we've come to learn is that that's what we, sh we should be doing. We were using harm reduction techniques in our own family. We just didn't know it. My mom was making sure she had you know, medication that was safe. She wasn't getting injection-related diseases. They kept a roof over her head mm -hmm. so she wasn't homeless and subjected to all of the issues that come with that. You know, Kayla passed away because of probably the hep C that she had gotten from using dirty needles. I mean, I, it could have been a plethora of things. I don't want to, but, um, you know, the only reason, Jordan said at one point in the film, mm -hmm. the only reason, well, actually, I took it out. I didn't turn to heroin <laughs> was because I didn't know where to get it. I didn't have any friends left, and I didn't have any community but mom. And if I did, I would have done it in a second, no question. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Can so, you talk a little bit about, you know, one of the th questions we get as filmmakers when you're applying for, for funding or, you know, you kind of get pushed back on, on a given topic that you choose to explore through a documentary film specifically. Can you talk about how why films really can and should be used as a tool mm -hmm. for social change, mm -hmm. and, and maybe a little bit about your impact campaign. Why would a film have an impact campaign okay. and what you really want to do, just to say mm -hmm. on the solutions kind of yeah, me? topic? Yeah, me? Okay, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I'm, I'm a big believer. I, I think having experienced this, it was like, 
you're gonna care more about whatever is right in front of you, whatever is most impacting you. And I think the closest thing we can get to that, the closest approximation, is film and storytelling. And I think we're, you know, entering so many new forms of storytelling um, that I'm so excited about, and including people self, you know, filming themselves on their, um, you know, on their cell phone. I, I think it's becoming much more, um, I don't know, equal in that way. Uh, but I think that I think. You know, it's for me. It, it just everybody says it puts a human face on it, but I think it, it touches us as close to how we can be touched if we had lived it. And those are the things we're going to be most driven mm -hmm. to change and to fight for and to act, even when we're exhausted or hopeless or you know somebody's back in office. Like you're tireless because you have to do something about it once it hits you in that place. So I think for me with Doc, any social issue or any person's story that I'm lucky enough to tell or to cover um, in any way, like that's the goal, is like you care about it as close to if you're living it or you love the person who's living it because, yeah, I think that's the, the best chance of, but that's. But what would be your wish if, if this film could make the one, one, one impact, oh, what would it be? Especially if we have a bunch one. of people <laughs> in, in the audience who do work with local organizations, how, you know, when you think about it as an impact, Tool, yeah. like public health tool, like what would be the, the wish? I always think of a better answer right when I leave, but yeah. uh, that's <laughs> a great question. I think you see every person who deals with this disease as your own daughter, your own mother, your own sister. Um, and I think I, I ask for a lot of patience from the audience for the first 30 minutes. It's basically like, watch my home movies. Uh, but I want you to know these people so before it hit them because I think the media has been saturated with, and of course it makes sense with people at their rock bottom, but it's hardest to relate to people in that state. That's part of the hell of addiction is that, you know, it's easiest to ostracize people when they're at their worst. Um, it's the person on the street, you know, and so seeing them as, you know, I, that's why I, you know, all I have is that grainy, crappy Super 8, but my sister, you know, looks like that woman you'd walk by. Um, and, you know, if you could see, you know, the tiny little smiling five-year-old flashes through your head, you know, I think seeing that will dictate how we treat it. Because, I mean, as you were saying, the mm -hmm. solutions are so complicated. I can't name one. Yeah, there's still 10 million people on long-term opioids for a drug that is not safe or effective. Effective being a huge <laughs> term there. 10 million Americans, that's insane to me. Um, and, and that every medical professional understand this disease to the degree that they could treat them, that, my, that the people who do make it out and their family members could go and get the kind of care. I'm like, I'm educating like, the best, some of the best doctors in Colorado on opioid use disorder every time they go to the doctor. I don't understand how that's still possible. That would be my wish, yeah. I, I think you also did a really great job of, of weaving through the narrative some of the like federal policy levers mm -hmm. without hammering it over the head like here's the bullet here's the talking point and yeah. for me one of the most powerful ones was the the, the statement about the level of training required um, to treat yeah. people with addiction mm -hmm. versus the level of anything required to prescribe um, the, the, the medicines that got yeah. them there in the, the first place and you know I think that's a particularly powerful um, moment in there that kind of also, you know, you're not just educating the general public about this could be anyone, we should take this, you know, seriously, educating providers about their role, but also kind of those still, you know, federal um, policy changes that we still very much need, or even yeah. state level policies. So just to follow up on that, <clears throat> since your film, that requirement has gone away. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, but still, most physicians aren't prescribing buprenorphine. Mm -hmm. So this gets back to the stigma, yeah. you know, as a physician, you, mm -hmm. you know, you learn about stuff in medical school, but you really learn when you are an intern and a resident and you have the prescription and you have to write the prescription. So you, you know, you get called down, there's a, you're in the hospital, there's a patient who's sick in the emergency room, you got to come take care of them and you go running down there and they say, well, but this patient is an addict. So you know, he's, he's addicted to pain medicine, so only give him, you know, two Percocets every mm -hmm. eight hours or some, some arbitrary number. Um, this is your senior resident telling you this. So you go down there and you have to do all mm -hmm. this medical stuff and then you, the patient is starting to go into withdrawal. 
and the two Percocets is not cutting it. Mm -hmm. And so the patient goes up to the, and, and, and you don't know to ask, you know, when, was, when were you last dosed? You know, that sort of desperation that the, like, I'll take anything, I need it now, and like, give me some pills. Like, that is a daily life, you know, you need to get dosed. So, and it's taken over your whole brain and your whole life. So if, if somebody's talking to you and they're not saying, you know, where are you on that roller coaster, if they don't ask that, then they're not, you're not, they're not, you know, it's, it's like she said, yeah. you're right in front of me, but I don't care what you have to say right. because I only care about that pill. Yeah. And uh, so that's, that's where they're at. So then the patient goes up to the floor and then it starts acting out because they need the medicine. Then the mm -hmm. nurse calls you back and you go up and see her and then, you know, and then there's more hassle and more disruption and you keep coming by and finally the patient gets more disruptive. So somebody calls the security guard and the security guard is sitting there in the hospital and they're sick and, and they've been through this before. The only reason they're in the hospital is because they're scared and they have no other options because they've tried everything else and it's not working and they're still sick and they're still terrified mm -hmm. and they're in there and they're feeling awful. Uh, and then finally, um, you know, this patient's very disruptive and finally they sign out the AMA form against medical advice. That's it. And they give you, <clears throat> flip you the bird and they storm off. And then the nurse says, oh, thanks a lot for dealing with that patient. And then the resident says, oh, good job with that patient. And then the attending comes in and says, oh, n nice, good thing you got rid of that patient because now we can take care of the real patients. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what does the intern learn that whole time is that I don't want to have anything to do with anybody with this disease mm -hmm. ever again. Yeah. Because nobody knows how to treat this. No, you know, yeah. if, if that interaction had started with, okay, you know, when was your last dose? What are you using? How much are you using? What can, what do we, let's come up with a plan about how to deal with mm -hmm. your, uh, you know, at least so you don't go into withdrawal and get you through this because we have to do this medical stuff. And by the way, you know, you might want to get on to buprenorphine. Mm -hmm. You might want to get on to methadone. You might want to, yeah. you know, try something like, yeah. so we just, we, because it's been separate from the medical mm -hmm. yeah. schools, the medical residencies and the doctors, the doctors, they've already been through training. They don't want to have anything to do with it. Right. You know, given the opportunity to have their waiting room full of people with opioid use disorder, they'll do anything to avoid it. Yeah. So getting rid of that obstacle is a good idea, yeah. but it's not, not and sufficient. Yeah, my yeah. sister went to the ER the other day, actually. She's having issues with her pancreas, but um, I think I was just telling someone out there, you know, the ramifications of long-term opioid use are so unknown too. So they feel like guinea pigs, both of them. So it's always this question of, well, could it be because of that? But that's beside the point. She went in and actually, you know, was having terrible pain, but did not tell them that she had been addicted yeah. to opioids because she said she didn't want to be treated like an addict. Like she was mm -hmm. just there for pain medicine. Yeah. She actually wanted tests ran and it, she ended up telling them. But um, I was like, it's been 15 years. How, and this is not, you weren't a one-off. This is a, you know, mm -hmm. A nationwide crisis. How are you still afraid to tell people in the ER this? But that's it's, the exact reason because yeah, people just stigma still oh there. my god. Like and yeah. speaking of that stigma, this is immediately bringing to mind for me. Um, when I was growing up, my, my little sister's dad had opioid use disorder, mm -hmm. and um, he lived with us in the same house from the time I was like four to seventeen. He later encountered some 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 issues several medical issues emerging from his injection drug use and his undermanaged diabetes. He was, you know, a black man with, um, also with a, a record of, a, a criminal record because of, <laughs> because of structures in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember in his kind of final days when I was like in my early 20s, this is a little more than 10 years ago now, um, he, you know, both of his legs had been, had been amputated as a result of, again, undermanaged diabetes and um, IDU. And as I understand, like, there was some kind of infection, and he was in really significant pain. And his sister was there in the hospital with him, um, but refused to tell his doctors that he was a person with opioid use disorder because of that stigma and because of, um, yeah, just, just, this, just the stigma. So I... Remember when when I called with my sister um, to tell him goodbye, that he he couldn't speak to us because he was in so much pain, 
because his pain was undermanaged. When, and that could have so easily been resolved were it not for, again, just the stigma of, um, of this crisis. So. Do you have any questions from the audience? Great. Yeah. They want to record yeah. your yeah. question. I think that's why you need the mic. Yeah, thanks. That's OK. Thanks. Jamie, my question for you is, assuming that the had at the time while your sister was increasing the dosage and there was question about the, you know, the, the treatment was not making progress. Why is it, do you think, that your parents were focused on treating that the pain was the problem and you saw the drug as the problem? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. It's probably the one I get the most. Like, why did you see it? Why do you think you saw it and not them? So I was thinking about it in the shower before this because I still feel like <laughs> I wrestle with it and I try to figure out the truth um, and the heart of it because I think it could be helpful to people. But the only thing I can come up with is that, you know, I think sometimes with things like this, I think like huge societal failures or systemic failures are so unimaginable on that scale. Um, sometimes it takes the young and I was 19 and I you know, I had just, I had just learned about alcohol tolerance actually because I went to a big state school and it had become a really big problem there. People were all of a sudden dying of alcohol poisoning. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so we, we got, we got a pretty in-depth tutorials on, on tolerance and how your tolerance builds. And that is how you, you know, die of alcohol poisoning. And it was just so cut and dry, you know, and it was pretty shoved down our throats. Um, and that was happening like at the exact same time. And I, I remember, and it was also distance, like there were so many factors. I've often heard that siblings are the first to recognize it within a family, um, to recognize substance use disorder. Uh, I think that we're just tuned in in a different way and maybe mm -hmm. extra critical of our siblings and looking for things, so there was that. I was also away at school and they were all three in a household together. Um, my dad was at a lot, a lot of doctor's appointments and I think if you're hearing that from, you know, again, like a very suburban, middle class, top of the line doctor, specialist after specialist after specialist that, you know, if you're in real pain, you really can't get addicted this, the way you're thinking of it, you know, and then that carries a whole different thing than me who's hearing it from my sister and my mom you know, I'm hearing it secondhand. I think that was a huge part of it. Um, and then I think my parents' generation was also brought up to trust medical professionals in a way I wasn't necessarily. Um, I think started, some of those fractures had started to show and, and they were just implicitly, you trust your doctor, you know? And that really wasn't the case as much for my generation. So there were so many things, but it was like, it was like the perfect storm. Um, and I wasn't convinced that they weren't really, really sick, but I was convinced, I did not, nobody could explain to me how these things would help, how there was ever an end if your tolerance is always going up. Nobody could, solve, nobody could explain that. And so it was like, then I just like, my temper was off the charts, because it was like, until somebody can explain this to me, nobody's getting off the hook. That comment about real pain, you yeah. don't get addicted if you're real pain, directly from from the Sacklers from Purdue. Oh, uh, I it was, it and so I remember being taught it in uh, training that, oh, wow. yeah, yeah. No, it's wow, yeah. Okay, one last follow up question to my who watched oh. this. Oh, yeah. well, this is a quick one. Has Christy Yamaguchi seen the film? You know, somebody said that to me recently, and I was like, no, but I should, I want to show it to her. Although I feel bad, my dad just holds her responsible. <laughs> no, she's still our idol. Hi, uh, Jim. <laughs> get, get, get the other one. <laughs> Hello? Yeah. Ah. <laughs> no. Oh, no. <laughs> no. Oh. He's drawn us into a very <laughs> 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 
<laughs> um, and so I, I hope this is an appropriate question, but at the very end, uh, you say the time you would go back to that moment as the last time you were all together. And can you tell us what that means? Yeah, um, that's the other question that everybody always asks. And I did, I definitely was opening a can of worms and I toyed with not including it because I understood that it was, like there, there was something unfair and not explaining that more, but at the same time, we're still so in the middle of it. So I can talk about, yes, what happened and then also like why I chose to include it and I'll try to make it brief, but um, it happened, uh, you know, and I say the date, but again, it's not, you know, unless you're tracking it closely, but it was five months before COVID happened. We live, I live mm -hmm. in New York. My parents live in Florida. My sister lives in Colorado. Um, the pandemic hit quick after that. We couldn't travel. Um, so my sister's meetings went online. I used to say that in an alternate version of the ending. Um, and she really, uh, her community, as you were saying, you know, as happened to millions, uh, really fell away. And you know, this lifeline for her had really been propped up on meeting in person. She's a social butterfly. You know that that that's the key of twelve step. If it works for anybody, when it works, it's that camaraderie and that support. And that was just gone. And um, so she she really started pulling away from my family and her friends and a lot of other people. And we were worried. And I used to actually say a lot of that at the end of the film and talk about how she pulled away. And then it felt, again, really unfair to, to point the finger at her, like to leave that spotlight on her when she was choosing to just have some distance, you know, create some boundaries, take some time and space for herself to then shine that on her in such a public way was like, that doesn't feel right. But to not include some form of that rupture, the ruptures that still exist, and then that every time another societal or systemic failure compounds that, um, and, that and that then it, it seeps in even further. So you talk about you know, your father's untreated diabetes, you know, and, then, and the racism within the medical structures, and then mm -hmm. you, know, you see how these things pile on top of each other, and then they, they rip at the things that are already there, mm -hmm. and then they're deadly for a mm -hmm. lot of people. And so to kind of just end it, like not tied up in a bow, but you know, we're all fine and we're trucking on, felt like really disingenuous too and probably unhelpful to people because I don't think anybody's really there, no matter what you've survived or endured. It's like, it's still there. You live with it every day. Um, so to point out those, you know, ruptures, but also um, do it in a way that really cared for the people that again, it's still happening to, um, felt important and so, playing with how we said that and why and how much detail we included. I've changed that ending probably 20 times and rewritten what I say. Um, and my nephew, who you see in the last frame, who was in the hospital, he's going to be seven in May. Wow. Um, my sister's had two more high-risk pregnancies since then. And she shared with us that, you know, that, you know, when you go through something like that as a family, you know, there's so much rebuilding that needs to be done and addressing the trauma and so much of that has yet to be done. And so you see that manifest in a lot of ways. And um, she's, her and I, or I did see her for the first time thanks to one of these screenings. I had to go out to Colorado and I kind of just showed up um, at our work. But um, we're, we're starting to talk and they're doing really well. But yeah, I think just to your point, you know, the ripple effects still feel very present um, mm -hmm. as they would for anybody. So I wanted mm -hmm. a way to point that out and make it real without doing any harm, basically. Yeah. But thank you for asking. We've been picking these films uh, on different topics, um, even though it's the Pandemic Center that's hosting them. Um, but it's been uh, not surprising, but uh, it's, it's been a theme that has actually popped up in the mm -hmm. other um, Films in part because of the, the you know, societal-wide impact that the pandemic has had. Um, but I, anyway, I just want to say that mm -hmm. um, we are exploring many different public health issues through this series, um, but it's always hard to kind of fully get away from the, the pandemic when we talk yeah. about public health today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because it just exacerbated everything that mm -hmm. was already there. Yeah. How are we on time? I don't know. I think we should. 
Okay. Um, well, this has been really very extraordinary. I'd, I'd like to um, thank um, Jamie and our, our panelists for spending the time with us, for sharing this um, incredible film, for working on these issues, for advocating for people who can't advocate for themselves, for um, trying to make change and using stories to do that. Uh, really very extraordinary. Um, I'd also like to um, give my thanks, uh, first of all, um, to the Brown Arts Ignite Brown Arts Institute and the Brown Arts Ignite series. Um, also want to thank uh, the Pandemic Center, uh, my colleagues who helped put this event together, Bentley Holt, Leah Lovgren, um, Andrea Ulig, and uh, Aquiel Person. Um, there's also refreshments in the lobby, uh, and um, please uh, make use of the films, uh, the resources that are um, offered through the film's impact page to stay engaged. We also are talking about um, sending out, oh, here are the Yes. some of the, the resources um, as well. Uh, we are also going to be sending out um, to um, people who signed up for this event um, resources as well. Oh, great. That's great. And um, stay tuned to our channels for information on additional Our Storied Health events, which will happen in the fall. Let's see if our panels are here. Well, y you will get them. So yeah. um, with that, we will adjourn. Thank you. Thank you.